Hello everyone, this is Sunny from Bottom Split Podium. I did finally decide on a channel name and I realized that with my low skills that I'm probably always going to be in the bottom splits, so that's why I came up with the name Bottom Split Podium. I hope you guys like it. Uh, over the last couple of months I realized that I definitely want to take sim racing more seriously and that means investing into a more long-term solution for my wheelbase. Uh, right now I own the Fnatic Club Sport 2.5 but uh, I wanted to get into something around $1,000 for a direct drive wheelbase, but I ran into the same predicament that a lot of people are facing right now. There's a lot of solutions out in the market, like the Fnatic DD1 or DD2, and there's solutions like the Semicube SC2, Sport, and Pro, and a lot of people are conflicted about which wheelbase they should buy that offers not only the best performance, but the best value. Now, the general consensus is that the Semicube 2 Pro is the best wheelbase that you can buy under about $2,500, and the reason for that is because despite only costing about 45 to 50 percent of what the Simicube 2 Ultimate costs, it offers about 80 percent or 85 percent of the performance. Now you might be wondering, well what if I don't want to spend fifteen hundred dollars? Well then you have things like the AccuForce V2 for $999 that even comes with a button plate and a steering wheel inside of the box and comes with a very highly reviewed uh, Sim Commander software. And then you also have solutions like the VRS Direct Force Pro, which is about $800, but you have to spend an extra $100 if you want the motor mount and the servo clamping kit that comes with it. And of course, uh, those solutions also offer their own challenges or hesitation on the market. A lot of people say, well, if you're gonna spend $1,000, that's almost the same price that you would spend on an OSW kit built with the Simicube 1 controller, which offers apparently much better detail and much stronger force feedback. But then if you say, well, okay, then why don't I buy a Simicube 1? Then the same people who told you that it's a better solution than the AccuForce or the VRS Direct Force Pro will go on to say, yeah, but that is only $200 less than a Simicube 2 Sport, and the Simicube 2 Sport is newer, the Simicube 1 is discontinued, and so on and so on. And basically you end up in this crappy sim racing version of Groundhog Day, where everybody's just looking for a thousand different ways to tell you the same thing. Buy the Simicube 2 Pro, it's better. But if you don't have $1,500 to spend, or you don't want to spend $1,500 on a Simicube 2 Pro, then does it really matter either way? So I looked to figure out exactly what that solution would be. What is something that is about $1,000 but would offer you a good balance of performance and value? And the solution came from none other than Philip Van Rensburg himself. He's also known as Bino on the iRacing forums and he's even sort of a major contributor to Granite Devices and sort of a lot of the history behind them building both the Simicube 1 controller board and the Simicube 2 direct drive solution. And he actually commented on one of my threads and he said, hey, you could still build the Simicube 1 because the controller itself and the Ioni Pro board are still being sold on Granite Devices product page directly. So even though everybody almost believes that the Simicube 1 has been discontinued, it's still a currently supported product by Granite Devices. And they even released a new version of their software recently, which offers a lot of the filters and a lot of the adding effects that you can get with the Simicube 2. So that's what I decided to do. So as you can see behind me here, I have my Club Sport 2.5 wheelbase with my Fnatic V2 Formula wheel. And I had been debating a little bit about whether I was going to convert the Formula V2 wheel in order to be used as a U universal wheel using a USB uh, conversion kit. I think it's offered by Simtech Racing is the website that makes it. Uh, but at the end of the day, I decided that I wasn't going to do that and I'm going to use uh, universal USB-based wheels moving forward. And next to it, I have the star of the show. Now this is the small midge motor, which is also, uh, the model name is the 130STAM10010. Uh, now if you had built a small midge based Simicube 1 OSW kit in 2018 or 2017, then the model number might have been a little bit different and the way that you ordered the motor might have been a little bit different. So let's start with the encoder. So I'm going to pick up this bad boy, which is quite heavy, I might add. And on the back, there's actually an absolute encoder attached to it. Now, if you built a Simicube 1, or if you bought a Simicube 1 from Sim Racing Bay uh, a few years ago, you had to buy a midge motor and an encoder separately, or you could buy them as a kit from Sim Racing Bay. So basically the midge motor would most likely be supplied with a 10,000 resolution encoder, and you would have to buy the Syncos or the BIS-C encoder separately, along with the housing in order to attach it to the motor, and then that would give you the solution that you needed. But actually, if you buy this motor, from Midge directly and you contact Lisa through email, you can actually request a BIS-C encoder 
from the factory and it'll come attached and it'll come wired already. Um, so I think that's where the A in the uh, 130ST AM10010 model name comes from um, because I had inquired from her about what the price difference would be between a 10,000 resolution and when she sent me the price quote, the model number for the 10K resolution encoder Mitch motor was actually the standard 130ST M10010. So that A in the model name is apparently for the higher resolution encoder. So this came with the encoder installed already, and this is the 2015 version of the motor. And uh, actually, the Direct Force Pro from BRS uses a similar small niche motor. Their motor has a DFP attached to the end of the model name, but that motor also has AM in the model name instead of just an M. And of course, the VRS uh, Direct Force Pro comes with a VIS-C encoder. So I think that the one difference between those two models, um, as pointed out by Sim Racing Garage, is that inside of the encoder housing, there's a thermal-based uh, stop switch, like a safety feature that's added to the Direct Force Pro small midge motor. But that actually isn't inside of this. I opened up the housing and I took a look inside just to get an idea of it. Um, and this is the midge motor mount uh, that's sold by Sim Racing Bay. Uh, it comes with all of their SimiCube 2 um, products. Like if you buy SimiCube 2 uh, Pro or Sport from Sim Racing Bay or even the Ultimate, they all come with this. Now it looks a little bit different from the images. Um, so actually the motor mount itself is a little bit different than the one that's actually on their webpage, but I'll talk about that later. So I'm just gonna put this back up on the table. And this is my universal wheel. It looks a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> Um, I bought a Leo Bodner BBI64 uh, Joy Pad Controller um, PCB board. It's a USB-B PCB board that comes with the uh, pins already wired, but it's quite a thick board. So when I wired it up, I realized that um, I couldn't just tuck it into the back of a button plate. So I built this with a 3D printer, and I didn't want to let any of the uh, outputs go to waste. So I actually programmed this for uh, 32 buttons and eight rotary encoders. Um, in the process, I damaged some of the cables while I was setting this up. So I think uh, two of the rotary encoders on the bottom, uh, they work as buttons, but the actual rotary function, um, there's an issue. I think the wires are touching each other because when I increase or decrease the rotary, it actually um, it hits both increase and decrease at the same time. Um, but this is a Fnatic uh, universal wheel. It's the R330 wheel, and I do not recommend using this for a small midge. The uh, leather grip actually flexes a little bit with the midge motor, so you can actually bend it. I'll show it in the video, but I don't feel confident that this uh, will hold up over time. I think that it will warp um, as you're using the wheel if you use high forces. So, But this is the wheel that I'm going to use for now until I buy an Asher Racing or a Formula wheel in the future, something that's actually built for a small niche motor or for a universal US, a universal USB button plate or formula wheel. Um, so it's okay for now, but I don't feel confident that it'll hold up in the future. Um, but I've got some magnetic shifters. I made these with a 3D printer. There's a Thingiverse uh, page, and I, I think that he might have taken that design from someone else. But uh, yeah, these are 3D printed uh, magnetic shifters. And this is a automotive grade um, quick release, but I have it on reverse because um, I'm waiting for some longer M5 bolts that uh, I can attach to the quick release itself. So this is actually the wheel side of the quick release, but um, I put it on backwards because um, this has like a like a small center, like sort of nub that sticks out. So if you were to want to attach it to the 70 millimeter servo clamp, you would need 35 millimeter long uh, M5 bolts and nuts. And um, I didn't have any of those lying around. They're a little bit long, so you have to order them. So I'll get into that later. Originally, I intended to actually do a build video where I actually go through a tutorial to share how to actually build the SimuCube 1 uh, controller board and box, but actually my build went off pretty smoothly. I want to say that the actual build time was less than one or two hours, and for the most part, everything went exactly like Granite Devices tutorial and uh, some of the videos that you find online um, have instructed you to do. So I've got my Meanwhile SDR 48048 power supply. And you could get away with a cheaper power supply than this. There's the NDR power supply and there's even an RSP power supply, which are much cheaper. And if you intend to run the small niche motor uh, around the capacity that the motor was intended for, which is 20 Newton meters of torque, then you really don't need that much more uh, powerful of a power supply than the NDR 48048 or even the RSP power supply. But the main reason I picked this one up is because it offers 720 watts of uh, voltage for up to three 
seconds. Uh, so you can, you can actually overdrive the motor to about 25 or 26 newton meters of torque. I wanted to see uh, for myself if there's gonna be any clipping that occurs when you increase the current, but I don't think that I'm going to do that because after testing the motor at 20 newton meters of torque, I realized that it felt like it was gonna rip my arms off. So I don't really think I need to overdrive, but I'm still glad that I picked up the larger power supply uh, just in case. Now, a few of the things that I wanna warn you about if you intend to build one of these motors is to make sure that you buy the supplies that you need and don't make the mistake that I did, which, cost, which ended up causing me to have to order multiple things over the course of a few days to a week because uh, I didn't actually do a lot of my research ahead of time. So one of the things that I'll warn you that you should make sure that you purchase is a 16 gauge electrical wire. Um, I didn't have enough uh, wire and I assumed that the power supply was gonna come with cables itself, but it didn't come with any cables. So um, I ordered a 16 gauge electrical wire and some uh, fork connectors just to make sure that I had enough cables to actually connect the power supply itself to the uh, semiconductor controller board. The other thing that you're going to want to take note of is to pick up some ferrite core um, mini USB cables. These help you reduce any chance of uh, electromagnetic interference. And um, I didn't know that none of the actual uh, components came with these cables, so I had to order these separately. Um, so a few things that I'll there's a few things that I want to take note of to let you know about. So an ITX case for the most part is going to offer you enough space and it'll even include a fan that you can connect to the fan connection on the CMYK controller board. But um, as you'll notice, I've got everything installed and I have a lot of free space in here. So I think that you could actually get away with an, an ITX case that's a longer, uh, more thin version as long as it has a case fan. The only thing that takes up a lot of space, I would say, is that the height of the CMYK with the Ioni Pro controller board uh, attached to it is about four centimeters tall and it's about I want to say 17 or 18 centimeters long and it's about five or six centimeters um, no maybe that's not correct maybe about eight or nine centimeters across so as long as you have something that fits those dimensions and fits the dimensions of the power supply you'll be able to get away with it and of course this case is pretty small so I don't feel like it takes up a lot of space but I could have made it even smaller um, this Rygene Tech case actually came with a three prong power adapter uh, by default. It had it installed. I, I can't remember if I took this out or not. I think this is removable. Maybe not. Um, but because I came with this, it came with this three prong uh, included. I didn't actually have to purchase one. Um, I have an extra one sitting over there. But um, if you buy a case that doesn't have this, then you're going to need a 10 amp uh, inlet. It's basically a three prong inlet so that you can basically attach that to the case and make sure that you can turn it on and off. Um, so that's about it in terms of how much space it takes up. I want to say that I was pretty surprised with uh, like how well built the CMYQ controller board is. It's a very nicely built uh, controller board and it seems like they put a lot of thought in how the electrical connections will be connected. So I didn't actually have to do a lot of soldering or any sort of like any sort of difficult electronics work. The only thing that I did have to do is I took an IKEA power drill that I had and if you have a more powerful drill it'll probably be a better idea but the IKEA drill is strong enough uh, it's just going to take you a little bit of time to get through the metal of the uh, motherboard tray but you'll need to drill out uh, four holes for the CMYQ board and you'll need to drill out some holes for the power supply itself so that you can attach them to the case. Uh, neither the CMYQ2 controller board or the power supply uses a standard ITX or computer ATX um, screw holes so that's gonna be something that takes a little bit of time and something that you'll have to consider. You could take a 3D printer and you could print a, maybe a tray using PLA and the tray could have four holes for the CMYQ controller and then it could have a motherboard ITX um, holes. But if you do do that, you're gonna wanna take note that you're going to want to ground the CMYQ board uh, to the chassis itself. So you're gonna wanna cut out an extra ground cable to make sure that it does that because PLA is not going to serve as a grounding component, whereas like these ITX chassis, you can actually um, screw the CMYQ controller board directly to the chassis and the chassis will ground it. The next thing I want to point out is that one of the other advantages to building one of these in, in the year 2020 is that, um, I don't know when this started, but if you look online and you start looking up what you need to buy in order to build a CMYQ uh, one based uh, OSW kit, is that a lot of people say that you need to buy cables, or at least you need to prepare cables. So one of the cables you need to prepare is for the encoder to the CMYQ2 controller, uh, the CMYQ1 controller, which is this 15-pin uh, D-sub connector. But actually, um, I bought a 15-pin D-sub connector, but I didn't actually have to do anything because Lisa sent me this cable prepared already. So both the encoder cable and the servo power cable were already prepared. This is how I got them 
directly from Midge. And they actually already have electrical shielding on the outside as well. And I've already verified that I'm not getting any electrical man magnetic interference because I did maybe about 30 minutes of driving in VR after setting up my Cinecube 1 and all of my settings. And I didn't experience any uh, losses of traction or any weird behavior inside of my VR helmet. Of course, uh, I did have some issues with my graphics drivers, but that was actually because of an AMD driver and not actually because of the VR drivers itself. So if you're running NVIDIA, you're not going to have any problems. My 1080 Ti didn't give me any problems, but I didn't experience any EMI issues at all. So these cables, they come with the Midge motor from Lisa, so you don't actually have to buy these cables from Sim Racing Bay. So not only is the encoder attached to the small Midge motor, but the cables are already prepared for you. So that's something kind of cool. Now for the next part of the video, I'm actually going to talk about the Asher Racing 70 millimeter shaft clamp adapter. Now, this is something that uh, I couldn't actually find a lot of videos online where people talk about it, so I decided to do it live. We're doing it live. Thing doesn't suck, but it could be confusing to realize how to use it because a lot of people just talk about it in comments and maybe you just uh, don't realize it. But when you receive this uh, hub from Asher Racing, one of the first things about it that you're going to notice is that um, it comes with a spacer. The spacer itself is not as thick as the head of the nuts itself, so you still need a little bit of space if the if the wheel that you're attaching or the quick release that you're attaching uh, goes over these heads a little bit. But I'll get into that later. That's actually not part of what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk about is that what most people realize is that if you want to remove this thing or adjust the the tighten it the tightness, like tighten it or loosen it, you have these four nuts. Of course, that part everybody understands, right? Everybody talks about that. They say, take these nuts out. Um, and as you tighten them, it tightens the clamp shaft. But uh, the shaft clamp, sorry, I'm having trouble speaking right now. But I get these out. What I didn't realize is that these two holes in the middle are actually how you loosen it. So you get these two nuts inside. And if you have an issue where you need to take it off and you're wondering, uh, how to get it loose. <laughs> um, this is how. Now maybe this is obvious, maybe people who use this clamp before know how to use this, but I didn't realize it until I figured it out while I was trying to mess with it. Um, hitting it with a hammer is not a good way to get it off, by the way, just, just so you know. I had tried that and it didn't work and it woke up my wife and my dog. So actually as you tighten these nuts, it will separate the top plate which holds the cone and the rear plate which holds the outer shaft. And as you get, once you get it loose enough, it'll just slide right off like that. Just like that. Now, the other thing that I didn't realize is that um, both the 70 millimeter wheel adapter and the actual shaft of the servo motor are very greasy when you get them. Um, you're going to want to dry this off. And I mean a lot. Uh, take some napkins. It's not recommended to use like rubbing alcohol. You don't want any sort of fluids or chemicals uh, leaking down into the motor itself because there's a bearing inside of here and any chemicals that you use they might actually damage or dry out the bearing so you're just going to want to use a microfiber cloth or some paper towels or something but you're going to want to use a lot uh, maybe three or four at least for each um, the 70 millimeter wheel adapter is is pretty oily when you get it from asher racing and the shaft of the uh, servo motor is pretty, like it's, it's pretty oily when you get it from Lisa and Mitch. And you're gonna wanna get it to the point where it's dry to the touch. Like when you touch it with your hands, you don't feel like you need to wash your hands afterwards. That's how much grease and oil you're gonna wanna get off. Because if you don't do that, even if you tighten this up and you get it really tight to the point where you can't, you can't tighten the nuts at all anymore, um, you could still get to the point where you actually test the force feedback and it's going to slip. And for those of you who experience a weird uh, loss of center and you don't know what it is, if the loss of center feeling that you get is that when the shaft is actually turning, you can feel sort of like, like, like a stutter, like a, like a bump, like it slips and then grips, slips and then grips. That's actually the shaft losing grip because of course it's tight enough that it's going to get grip again as, as it heats up, but, uh, but it's going to slip for at least a few millimeters at a time. And when that happens, you're going to lose center and you're going to realize when the car's when your wheels uh, turned to the center, you, for some reason, like the car is still turned to the left or the right a little bit. So that's actually what happens from slipping. So that's one thing that I didn't realize that I needed to do uh, when I first set this up. So as soon as you are about to attach the wheel adapter, just wipe it down for a few minutes, uh, this and the, the Asher Racing uh, 70 millimeter adapter. What I would even recommend is, is tighten this up to the point where you get the whole thing separated 
just loosen it up all the way and even wipe down the inner cone and the outer shell itself. Like just wipe it down because you don't need it to be lubricated at all. Just make sure that once you get it back in that you have this opening uh, opposite of the opening at the top. Uh, that's how it came and I'm, I'm guessing there's a reason for that, but uh, it might have to do with how it, how it clamps and holds grip. But uh, other than that, you know, get it out, dry it out, and then install it and you won't experience any uh, slipping at all. I didn't experience any slipping once I pulled it out and dried it, but it was a weird problem to diagnose. So in this next clip, I actually recorded audio uh, when I made the video, but uh, something was wrong with my microphone, which caused uh, the audio to come out really choppy. So uh, I'm going to do like a voiceover and basically talk about what I was explaining in the video. But basically this 70 millimeter wheel adapter that you purchased from Asher Racing, it has uh, four M4 bolts that you attach that sort of also clamp the uh, adapter to the um, drive shaft. And uh, what you're going to want to do is when you mount it, you're going to tighten each of the screws uh, with hand torque until you can't turn it anymore. And then you're going to tighten the screw that's across from it. So you'll tighten one screw and then you'll move over and you'll tighten the one that's across from it. And uh, the thing is, is that as you tighten each screw, the screw that's across from it is going to create more space between it and the clamping plate. So you're going to want to tighten that screw too. And you're going to want to keep doing this until all four screws uh, no longer have any ability to be turned. And then what you're going to want to do is take, uh, for me, I used a size 12, but you're going to get a Allen key and then stick it into one of the 70 millimeter holes. And you're going to use your hand to push down as leverage. And then you can use that to sort of uh, push down in the opposite direction. And then you can tighten the screws even further. Um, doing that, I was able to get maybe another few millimeters of torque on each of the screws, which allowed me to tighten it even further. Um, so you can see in the video that I'm able to tighten it even more, even though I couldn't tighten it anymore using just hand strength before. So using that sort of like leverage to create a lever arm uh, gives you the ability to tighten the screws even further. And uh, you're going to know when you get to the point where the clamp is, is pretty tight when you actually look at the space between the uh, conical uh, front plate of the clamp and the rear clamp. If you see that there's very little space in between both of them, then you'll know that the uh, clamp is close to being as closed as it can be. And that's because when the clamp is fully closed, the uh, diameter of the center of the clamp is actually only 22 millimeters, which, which is also the diameter of the drive shaft. There's one thing I wanted to warn you about, um, and this is the one issue I had when I was setting up the software for the CineQ. Now, when you're following the guide or the wiki or even um, Six Degrees of Flight's uh, YouTube video that has build instructions, he talked about how he couldn't detect the CineCube in DFU mode, and he had some issues flashing the Ioni uh, software, which is the first step. Um, and indeed, if you're running Windows 10, um, especially a late version of Windows 10, like, like anything like 2004, for example, the 2004 um, newest version of Windows 10, or the Creators Update, you're gonna have an issue where when you go into Device Manager, I'm just gonna open this up really quickly, and down here at the bottom, you're gonna see another, I believe, a U, Universal Serial, Serial Bus Controller section, and when you expand it, you're gonna see the words STM32 bootloader. And you're gonna be really confused about why you don't see the device in DFU mode. And when this happens, this is what you're gonna to wanna to do. So first, uh, open up an explore window and you're gonna to wanna to go to C program files x86 and scroll down to ST microelectronics folder. Open this folder, double click on the software folder, the diffuse folder, go into bin, and inside of bin, there's a folder called driver. Now, if you're running uh, Windows 10, of course, you're gonna go into the Windows 10 folder. And depending on the architecture of your, not only your processor, but your operating system itself. So if you're wanting Windows, Windows 10 64-bit edition, you're gonna wanna run the AMD 64 installer, even if you have an Intel processor. So AMD 64 is the instruction set. So even if you're running an Intel i7 9700K or a 9900K or any Intel processor, if you have more than uh, four gigabytes of RAM and you're running a 64-bit processor, 64-bit uh, operating system, you're gonna wanna run the AMD 64 EXE. But if you're running a 32-bit OS, then double-click the x86 uh, EXE. Now remember, this has nothing to do with the processor architecture that you're running. So x86 is not just for Intel processors and AMD 64 is not just for AMD processors. This depends entirely on the operating system you're running. So if you're running a 64-bit, yeah, Windows X64 is the 
AMD 64 EXE. Do not install the driver by, you might be tempted to right click the device here in your device manager and then go on update drivers and then direct it to the folder here. Don't do that because Windows has a weird sort of issue where if the timestamp of the driver is older than the driver that you're pointing it, like than the driver that it already has installed, it's not going to install the driver you direct it to even if you tell it to manually. And for some reason, uh, ST Microelectronics, they dated this driver to 2010. I have no idea why they did that, but because they did that, Windows will automatically say, nope, I have the newest driver already, so you can't update it. So you have to run this EXE. Once you run this EXE file and you install it, you'll be able to see uh, a device in DFU mode inside of Device Manager, and then you can kick off your installation from there. So that's the end of the build tips that I have, like all the advice that I gave. You can basically add that advice to the tutorial video by Six Degrees of Flight and the Wiki by Granite devices, and you should be good to go. You, you won't experience any hiccups or issues. All right, let's give it a try uh, driving and iRacing. Now, I haven't actually mounted my emergency stop, so it's kind of just floating here next to my rig. So let's go ahead and turn that. So power goes to the wheel, and let's make sure my wheel is centered. Yeah, with the BIS-C encoder, you have such a high resolution that even slight movement in the wheel will uh, cause it to change even like fractions of a degree. It's pretty amazing how high resolution these wheels get. But I'm gonna go here to profiles and I actually have a profile that I created for iRacing and a GT3 that felt good for me. Um, so I am using some direct input effects, uh, sine wave, square wave. The only one that I don't have enabled is spring and friction. Um, I have my force reconstruction filter set to six and I have the other filters just 10% all across. Now, these are the settings that I felt good with, but of course uh, your mileage may vary and uh, depending on how you like the force feedback to feel, like it's all sort of up to personal taste. Uh, it might feel better for you or not, but I feel like these settings are definitely safe. <laughs> so if you're looking for settings to start with that are not going to cause some sort of violent reactions from the wheel and give you any issues, then you can go ahead and try these settings and. Uh, I feel pretty confident that you're not going to have any issues where the wheel just suddenly starts rapidly oscillating um, on you. But I'm going to show you my settings in iRacing and we're going to take it out for a drive really quick. This is actually my second time recording this. I had an initial impression where I drove it the first time after I connected it, but my audio was sort of messed up. So I have to record this again, unfortunately. But I will sort of talk about what my first impressions were when I tried this out. Uh, the first time. Okay. So let's go into options and make sure that my sound is configured properly. Okay. And uh, I find that the engine is kind of loud, so I'm going to reduce that a little bit. And I think all my buttons are configured. So let's go ahead and go in for a test drive. But before that, I'm going to show you my force feedback settings. Now, previously, uh, if you did not disable or enable that setting inside of app.ini, then the max force here would actually be, if you modify your wheel force, uh, this max force, the highest value that you can get would reduce. So max force would start going from like 20 Newton meters to like 18, 17, or 16. And unfortunately, uh, that doesn't feel very good. So you don't wanna use that setting. But right now, if I reduce it, like let's say I wanna set it to 17 Newton meters, I can actually freely move the max force itself. And the higher you make this value, like if you lower the max force, uh, the value will actually increase because what it does is it creates a, a higher proportion. So like the denominator gets higher. So basically if you use 50 Newton meters and the wheel force is 17, then the force that you get at the wheel is going to be reduced to the point where uh, it's, it's not going to be as strong of a force feedback. They have a setting called one to one, which is basically if you were to set your wheel force to 20 Newton meters and you were to increase this to 20, which is the highest, this is called one to one, and it's very, very strong at this setting. Um, I wanna say you're gonna have trouble uh, holding the wheel with your arms. I, I mean, unless you're like a like a bodybuilder or something, uh, you're gonna have a lot of trouble holding the wheel for an extended duration of time. So you're gonna wanna set this at least, I, I would recommend at a minimum 30, but for me, I felt pretty good at uh, 45. 45 was about where I felt. Good. Um, I'm not running any damping or min force or anything like that, but let's go for a drive and I'll show you how it feels.
The first racing sim I'll talk about is iRacing, and honestly it's the largest difference I felt when dialing in the Simicube, and also the most punishing when the settings weren't dialed in correctly. If you don't set the I and I file to display the linear and Newton meters, you'll experience some violent oscillations when driving on straights, and especially when ABS engages under hard braking. But once you enable that setting and set your max force and wheel strength to around 45 over 20, you'll get close to the level of force feedback that most people recommend. When it comes to the force feedback itself, iRacing is where I felt the biggest difference in improvement over the Club Sport 2.5. Actually, when I drove iRacing with the Fnatic wheelbase, it was my least favorite force feedback of the three compared to Automobilista 2 and Assetto Corsa Competizione. I think there's a lot of hidden details in iRacing's force feedback model that aren't immediately noticeable when you use a belt-driven wheel. The curbing was the biggest improvement for me. When I'm on curbing in the club sport, the feeling is more binary, where you feel the curb or you don't feel it. But with the Semicube, I can actually feel how far on the curbing I am, and I can feel the curbing sensation moving left to right as I get closer to the turf at the edge of the curb. I also had improvements to how I felt the steering wheel move based on chassis movements during bumps in the road, hard corners, or hitting curb bumps and bouncing the car. iRacing essentially went from my third favorite force feedback to my most favorite, just from all the hidden details that I noticed with the Semicube and small midge. I did try to drive with what's called a one-to-one -one ratio of force feedback and wheel strength, and let me tell you, that is a workout. When you enter a corner hard and the wheel wants to jerk left or right in response to simulated g-force, the wheel's going to turn whether you like it or not, and the best you can do is to hope to be able to hold on. I don't recommend running the full 20 newton meters of wheel strength, especially not with GT3 on a track with long, fast corners like the Indianapolis Speedway. I'll say in conclusion that iRacing was a massive improvement in force feedback for the club sport over the G29, but I wasn't expecting it to be as large of a difference when moving from the club sport to the semi-coupe. Boy was I wrong. While the club sport is definitely no slouch in force feedback for iRacing, the semi-coupe OSW opens up a larger range of lower and higher signals, along with being not only smooth, but very fast. I felt like the sensations in the wheel matched what I was seeing visually in the car at nearly one-to-one -one timing. It felt closer to what it's like to drive a real car. If you mainly drive in iRacing, you're going to notice a very large difference moving to the semi-cube, definitely. Alright, so the next thing we're going to try out is Automobilista 2. Uh, so really quickly, I'm going to show you the settings that I kind of landed on that feel pretty good. Um, for this particular simulator, I run uh, slightly reduced other filters. Damping is at 10%, friction at 8%, uh, inertia at 6%. And you know what, I'm going to reduce that to zero because now that the force feedback feels good, I'm going to just sort of reduce these permanent effects that I have. Um, static force reduction at 10% and none of the direct input effects are enabled. I think Automobile Lista 2 does not use the direct input effects and I think that's why I disabled them. I think I read that online. Now one thing I'm going to warn you about um, because this particular issue, I was hung up for quite a while before I could figure out what it was. Automobile Lista 2, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, if you're tr looking into buying your first simulation, uh, I would recommend not getting Automobilista 2 for your first sim. And the reason why is because um, Automobilista 2 has a lot of issues. It was officially released, but um, it still has bugs. The replay function doesn't work very well. And I wanna say that there's certain bugs, like uh, certain cars have very strange traction behavior and uh, certain features just don't work well. So um, I'll say that like, if you're very patient, like I, I'm, I consider myself to be a pretty patient person. So for me, the, the feel of the force feedback and the physics and the amount of courses and content that's available for such a low price make it a good value for me. But I can't strongly advocate for it as your first, especially not your only simulator, because you're going to have some issues with it. And you're going to wonder, like, is this how all simulators are? But they're not. So like, I recommend starting with something else. I'm going to make a video where I make a recommendation for what your first actual sim racing game should be. Um, spoiler alert, it's not iRacing, <laughs> but um, Automobilista 2 is also not my recommendation for people who are just starting out. But yeah, so when you first run Automobilista 2, and if you're coming from an, another wheel like a G29 or a uh, Thrustmaster T300 or even a Fnatic Club Sport, the very first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to Documents. Automobilista 2 folder, and you're going to want to control all everything in this folder and just delete it. Just right click it and delete it all. Um, I want to say that it's probably this FFB custom settings folder, but it could be something else.
but basically these actual settings um, they create an issue where your Simicube one is not going to get force feedback from the game itself. Um, it's a very weird thing and you can't fix it with any settings in the actual game itself. The only way to resolve it is to just delete all the content inside of this folder, which is unfortunate because you're going to lose your graphics settings and you're going to have to reconfigure all your button mappings from scratch if you had like a button box. But yeah, this is one of the cons of Automobilista 2, unfortunately. Um, oops, I did not want to close that. So yeah, that's the one thing I'm going to recommend um, is to yeah just go into that documents folder and delete everything in there. So now let's get into Automobilista 2 and let's go for a drive. So when you first get into Automobilista 2, one of the first things you're going to want to do is to map your controls. And when you do that, you're going to notice that when you try to edit assignments and steer left and steer right don't work properly. When this happens, I'm going to recommend that you alt tab to let's uh, alt tab really quickly to Simicube configuration. No, we didn't. No, okay. And you're gonna want to go to profiles and in steering range set this value to 270. Um, and then don't forget to hit save settings to Simicube after you've done that. And once you set it to 270, um, Automobilista 2, you'll actually be able to steer left and steer right, and it'll actually pick up. The, the mappings. Um, so that could frustrate you for a while. Just make sure you set it back to 900 degrees or you're going to be running the turn radius of a, I don't know, some hyper strong, like short wheelbase formula car or something. So make sure you go out and uh, adjust that turn radius back to 900 unless you want to drive like, I don't know, like some Need for Speed arcade game from back in the 90s. Um, and then you're going to want to go through and, and map everything. I'm going to calibrate my pedals really quick because my brake pressure is kind of strange. pretty good about 57% for the brake pedal. I'm running a load cell and I'm not using my driving shoes so I can't really brake that hard. So let's go into a single race. Um, on iRacing I, I didn't race with any opponents um, but that was kind of on purpose. And let's go to something weird. Let's go to some weird track that doesn't exist in any of the other, in any of the other simulators. Interlagos, is that on iRacing? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Interlagos, uh, practice and qualifying disabled, but let's go to, I don't want to run 10 laps because that's a lot. <laughs> Oops, no, 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 no. Let's just do a quick four lap race. I think that's enough time for me to bore you guys with the Next up is Automobilista 2, and this was surprising to me. The Simicube definitely feels stronger and the road details like bouncing from the road and the strength of counter steer definitely feels better than the club sport wheelbase. And overall, the force feedback in Automobilista 2 feels generally better on the Simicube than it does on the Club Sport. But what's surprising to me was that the Simicube showed me that Automobilista 2's force feedback itself isn't as good as iRacing's, or as much better than Assetto Corsa Competizione as I originally thought. I still consider it to have better force feedback in some ways than Assetto Corsa Competizione, but I think Automobilista 2 has some kind of upper limit to the amount of quality and details that you get in curbing and road surface and it feels like you get pretty close to that limit with a belt-driven wheel. Unlike iRacing, curbing more or less still felt very binary in Automobilista 2 like it did in the club sport. Basically, no matter how much I was on the curb, a few centimeters or full left tires directly on top, the feeling in the wheel was basically the same. Zero bumping and then boom, full curbing force feedback. And while the curbing sensations themselves felt better in the Simicube, meaning the magnitude of the sine wave function for curbing force feedback was stronger as I drove over them, the curbing itself didn't become more detailed on the Simicube like I expected it to, like it did in iRacing. Overall, the quality of the force feedback itself felt very similar to how it felt in the Club Sport, with the exception that it was both faster, and it matched the in-car visuals better, and there was a bigger difference in the magnitude of forces. The only area where there was a clear improvement over the Club Sport was when the wheels were hopping, and the steering wheel oscillated left and right. In the club sport, the acceleration of the wheel to stronger force feedback, forcing me to fight the wheel to keep it straight, was a lot more subtle and I was able to fight it pretty easily. With the Simicube, I had a much stronger feeling that wasn't elastic at all. I felt like the wheel was physically pushing my arms left to right and the wheel was snap over steering. I'll say that the force feedback during hard cornering in Automobilista 2 feels better on the Simicube, but the rest of the force feedback itself feels eerily similar to the club sport 
with the exception of the low and high forces having a larger delta and the force feedback itself coming very fast. I will say that configuring Automobilista 2 for the SimiQ presented me with some challenges when my button mappings weren't working correctly for steering or the pedal axes. Dealing with those issues and also finding that the force feedback settings in Automobilista 2 were so limited left me feeling like I was working very hard for very little reward. My impressions of Automobilista 2 seem to get worse and worse as my hardware and dependency on dialed settings becomes more advanced. I'll probably come back and review Automobilista 2 again and give some impressions on whether I feel like it's a good simulation to purchase, but right now I'm leaning more towards I don't recommend it. Alright, so the last sim that I'm going to try out is Assetto Corsa Compezioni. Um, this took me a while to find settings that I was comfortable with. I know they look really simple, but the force reconstruction filter, I feel pretty happy with it at 5, um, and my damping, friction, and inertia are all 15%. 10% on static force reduction, and I'm only using damping at 100%. And these are the settings that I found to be pretty good. Um, or at least for me, they're pretty good. Um, as always, your force feedback is sort of like a personal preference. So, you know, but like I said, the settings that I use, I consider them to be safe. So, like, if you don't want to experience any sort of, like, jerkiness or weird things happening, then using these settings, you could start with my settings and then slowly either reduce or increase the filters to a level that you like. Um, but I definitely, I can promise you that the settings that I have are not going to cause any sort of like crazy behavior um, for you. So let's go into audio and make sure my, okay. Assetto Corsa Competizione is another, like iRacing is the only uh, simulator that I feel very happy with the way that the sound behaves. iRacing also has like a weird like it's really loud for some reason. I promise I'm not like this old man who's just like, that's so loud. <laughs> but like, it, it's just, it's it's loud to the point where I can't even hear the crew chief or people on Discord. Uh, that's like a set of courses default uh, loudness. So uh, let's go into my controls. So I, I set my gain to 53%, uh, dynamic damping at 10% and road effects to 12%. Minimum force is something that you only want to use if you have a sort of a G29 or like a T150 Pro, a wheel that has like a very, uh, like a much lower max force feedback uh, strength. You're going to want to set a minimum force higher just to make sure that even lower details are felt. Um, but you're going to want to set this to 0%, even if you're not using a direct drive wheelbase. I think if you're using like a CSL Elite or a TSPC Racer, you're going to want to set uh, your minimum force to 0%. Let's make sure I have shift up, shift down. Because I have look right, look left, ignition starter. Those are the important ones, I think. Look back, yeah. All right, I have the important ones to take you guys out for a drive. So let's go for a single race. I'm going to go for a quick race, uh, five minute race. Starting position of 10 sounds good. 90 for opponent skill and aggression. Five minutes is enough of a race. Yeah, let's uh, Ferrari GT3, and I drove Silverstone before. Let's go to Monza. Monza feels good, right? I can barely get like what, like two lap, three, three lap, maybe three laps in. Yeah, pro settings. Yeah, that's good. A set of course is another simulator where I feel like my opinion differs from what the vast majority of like the people who are like enthusiasts, they, they tend to criticize a set of courses force feedback and physics. I feel like a set of course has really good physics and force feedback, but let's see if that holds up with SimiQ. The last sim I tested with the SimiQ for this review was a set of course Competizione. Again, I was slightly disappointed with the lack of horizontal detail in the curbing in the simulator. It's ironic because I considered its physics and force feedback to be better than iRacing when I originally compared these three simulators on my, on my club sport wheelbase. But when using the SimiCube, I felt like the curbing was also very binary, just like in Automobilista 2. However, outside of the curbing, Assetto Corsa Competizione was an across-the-board improvement over the club sport when it comes to the details of the force feedback, the speed, the smoothness, and how alive the car felt at the wheel. Out of the three, Assetto Corsa Competizione required the least amount of work to get it drivable after changing wheels. I pretty much only had to set up some initial settings in SimiCube software and adjust my gain inside of the options and I was good to go. In fact, Assetto Corsa Competizione even detected my SimiCube on launch and already had my steering axis mapped. 
In terms of road detail, I felt a lot more of the chassis movements in the wheel on the Simi Cube than I did in the Club Sport. And even subtle minor, minor details like wheel hopping during traction loss was more noticeable with the direct drive than it was on the Club Sport wheelbase. Of course, the jump in force feedback wasn't as drastic in Assetto Corsa as it was in iRacing, but I take that to be more of a testament to Assetto Corsa Competizione's developers' focus on commercial wheels like the Club Sport and CSL Elite versus having a force feedback system that feels great on direct drive wheels but requires more dialing in. There's probably some settings and configurations I have to play with to really open up the details in this simulator, but as I've said in previous videos, I'm just not a fan of digging into and spending hours on settings to make things look or feel good. But overall, there was a definite improvement in force feedback, my ability to catch slides, the strength of the wheel force when turning into hard corners, and feeling wheel hop from ABS activation when I moved to the Simi Coupe from the Club Sport wheelbase. So as you can see, I have my Club Sport boxed up, which means that I've more or less made a final decision, which is that, yeah, I mean, well, I, of course I already built the OSW at Simi Cube, so it was a given that unless something went terribly wrong, I was most likely going to sell my Club Sport 2.5, but I already found a buyer, so this thing's getting boxed up to be shipped out. Um, but yeah, um, I'd like to conclude how I feel about an OSW kit in 2020. Like, how does a Simi Cube 1 feel in 2020? And uh, basically, Basically, I think it's a really good choice. Um, I think that now that it's been a few years since the Simi Cube 1 uh, came out and there's been a lot of tutorials and information out there, I think that a lot of the issues that you're going to face have more or less been ironed out. There's build tutorials where any conceivable issue that you could have has already been discussed and there's already been solutions found for it. Things like getting the board to be read in DFU mode and how to flash the right firmware and any issues and bugs that have existed in the software in prior versions have already been ironed out. There's even like hundreds of people making posts online about different settings that you can try out. So if you build an OSW kit with a SimiCube, I wanna say that like if you follow the instructions carefully, if you follow my uh, advice and you watch Six Degrees of Flight's YouTube video, I'm gonna link it again right now in the corner. Um, and if you follow Granite Devices Wikipedia, you should be up and going within a few hours of getting everything to your doorstep. I, I wanna say that the hardest part is probably gonna be mounting it to your rig because it's a little bit heavy but more or less building it is, is really straightforward. Um, and right now, the Mitch motor offers a lot of advantages compared to what it was like to order it a couple of years ago. Lisa from Midge is able to fit it with a BIS-C encoder and shielded cables right out of the box. You just literally pull the cables out and connect them as they're given to you directly into the SimiCube. They're already set up to be connected directly to the SimiCube. And I tried out racing in VR and I didn't experience any issues with ele electromagnetic interference or any sort of loss of signal or tracking. I had zero issues with any of my Bluetooth connections or wireless connections or any buttons being read. Um, zero issues at all. So I think the shielding works great with the cables that came from Lisa. And the fact that it came with a BIS-C encoder, not only installed, but already wired, just basically saved a lot of time for me. So I wanna say that building a SimiCube 1 in 2020 is a very viable option, especially if you don't feel comfortable spending $1,500 on a SimiCube 2 Pro. And that's if you're lucky. For me in Japan, the SimiCube 2 Pro would probably cost me around $1,600 or $1,700 because of uh, duties, customs fees, and also the shipping costs. And there's no actual distributor of the SimiCube 2 Pro within domestic Japan, so I would have to order it from overseas. Uh, the shipping costs for a Midge motor and for the SimiCube 1 and the Ioni board were a little less than $80 for all of those components. So I feel like the SimiCube 1 offered a lot of price advantages for me. In terms of how it feels, it doesn't feel like an old motor at all. It feels very good. It feels very solid, very detailed. The level of detail is very strong. Um, so I absolutely recommend building a Simi Cube 1 in 2020. If you feel like you want to get a direct drive wheel for under $1,000, I really don't think that there's anything in the market that's better than this. Um, I would love to be proven wrong, but the AccuForce, the AccuForce Pro V2, it's only 13 newton meters of torque and it runs a stepper motor. And the Sim Magic M10, which is also $1,000 and comes with a wheel, um, it's only 10 newton meters of torque and it's also a stepper motor. So, I mean, it's physically impossible that either of those motors could be smoother or more detailed or stronger than the small midge motor that I have paired with my OSW kit. So I feel pretty confident about the decision that I made. Um, if you have any issues or you have any concerns or you would like any advice, uh, please feel free to drop me a question or a comment below and if you'd like to know how to order uh, from Lisa at Midge. The thing is, I was going to attach the email address in the video and show it as an overlay, but her email address changes a lot. So 
it's usually some variation of like I think like her last name and and then something Midge or Hongzo or something like that at Outlook.com or um, or I think she also has a Gmail email address. But in general, like it's a lot better if you go onto Granite devices and you get like the newest email address from uh, Bino or Philip directly because if it changes, you're gonna have trouble getting a hold of her. I'm gonna put the email address that I used in the comment of the video below, but um, just make sure you let her know if you're ordering the motor, make sure you let her know that it's for an OSW kit and that you want the BIS-C encoder. Um, and one more final note, I'm not doing any sort of like financial endorsement. I have 25 subscribers. Nobody's trying to give me money for my channel. So I'm not doing any of this for money. I had to pay with my credit card to buy everything that I'm using here. The only reason I'm advocating for it is because I verified that it's good and I've used it and I can tell you that, yeah, everything's good. Like every, ordering the Midge motor from Lisa went really smoothly and you're probably gonna pay the same price that I did. So yeah, that's the last thing. But yeah, thanks for watching. Um, now I'm gonna try to go and enjoy my DIY OSW kit um, and maybe see if I can make my skills match as good as my hardware is. Uh, so please don't make fun of me for my drive. Actually, you know what? Yeah, make fun of me for my driving. My driving sucks. Please let me know in the comments below. Thanks guys. Uh, this was uh, Bottom Split Podium. And uh, in another video, I'm gonna talk about uh, building a button box and whether you should buy a 3D printer for sim racing. Um, I think having a 3D printer, it offers a lot of advantages specifically for sim racing if you're willing to do a little bit of wire soldering um, and doing a little bit of design, you could save a lot of money with a 3D printer. So I'll talk about that in the next video. But if you have any video ideas for videos that you would like to see about sim racing or uh, being into this hobby in Japan, let me know below and I'll do my best to meet your requests. Thanks guys, see you next time.